As of now, what's happening in Gaza has become a sort of litmus test for the world to see which country has moral standards and which does not. As for South Africa, it's deeply supporting Palestinians because they are losing their lives in thousands in a conflict they have nothing to do. Yet, Israel is bombing the Gaza Strip, where hospitals have reached their breaking point. That's when Naledi Pandor, the Minister of Foreign Relations and Cooperation of South Africa spoke, exposing what the African Union has become. During her speech, she not only told things which were brutally true, but also things that could have broken the illusions the West likes to see. After exposing everything and feeling surprised that an African organization had done something like that, he threatened that South Africa would abandon the African unions. But what did he say, and what the African Union has done, that has made it look not much different than the ECOWAS, which is considered a West's puppet? Let's find that out and listen to the bravest Nalady Pandor. Recently speaking at the opening panel of the International Dilemmas of Humanity Conference, the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa, Naledi Pandor was wearing a Palestinian scarf. Taking the mic, she delivered a liberation speech, which will perhaps be remembered for generations. She started by saying that the world is in a state of profound turmoil, and she did not want anyone to sugarcoat the situation because it's far from easy. She said that we are confronted with a world that's grappling with a mass of challenges. She said that her realization of this came in 2021 when Ishii attended a summit of the Executive Council of the African Union. It was brought to her attention, in hushed tones, that the African Union Commission chairperson had extended an invitation to Israel to become an observer at the African Union. You can imagine her shock. At that moment, she decided to take action. She made up her mind to raise her hand and propose the rescission of this decision. Therefore, she went around the room seeking support from the 54 nations present, but she managed to secure three. Nonetheless, she was resolute that this decision would not stand. So, she raised her hand and announced that she wished to discuss this matter. She said that as a South African representative, she firmly objected to it, and it should not be put into effect. She demanded that the leaders discuss it and South Africa would never accept it. She confessed that South Africa acknowledges the pivotal role the Organization of African Unity played in the fight for freedom in South Africa. Yet, this decision by the AU Commission chairperson made everyone ponder whether South Africa should continue its participation in the African Union. She said that she expected to receive widespread support from the countries gathered in the room. But what she discovered was disheartening. Countries that continue to oppress, that remain colonial occupiers, are leveraging their financial influence to provide aid to African nations and there be secured the depoliticized support of these countries. She candidly said that Israel is among these oppressive nations that play an extremely detrimental role in Africa. She clearly said that she wanted to be candid because she was addressing a room full of trade union leaders and representatives of progressive organizations. She said that it's their responsibility to convince African and Southern countries' governments, as well as governments worldwide, that they cannot tolerate such situations. This burden cannot fall solely on members of the government. Progressive organizations must also take up these issues. She said that she is doing her job and the decision regarding Israel's observer status has not been put into practice, and it won't be as long as she was there. But she asked, what was everyone else going to do about it? She said that the trade unions should be in dialogue with progressive unions all over the world. Trade unions in the United States, whether they are strong or weak, should make it abundantly clear to President Biden that they do not favor statements that have contributed to the ongoing tragedy. The labor movement in the United Kingdom should follow suit. She said that Africans have to reignite their organizational strength. She clearly was sad about what had happened to our organizational capabilities because, during South Africa's struggle against apartheid, the trade union movement marshaled international solidarity to an extent not witnessed since. She asked, where have all these progressive leaders gone? Why are we unable to mobilize? Why are we sitting in a room with only 300 when there should be 3,000? Naledi Pandor delivered a compelling address to the audience, drawing attention to a significant and urgent matter. She highlighted the current state of global turmoil and stressed the need to acknowledge the profound changes happening in the world. 
Pandora expressed deep concern that the core values and principles of progressive movements had been consistently eroded and silenced. She underlined the need to reinvigorate and reorganize the progressive movement, which had seen its voice marginalized. Pandor placed a strong emphasis on strategic planning and the importance of translating eloquent speeches into concrete actions and tangible outcomes. Pandor urged NUMSA, the National Union of Metalworkers of South Africa, which is the biggest trade union in South Africa, to take a leadership role in a new initiative. She proposed that Comrade Irving Jim and Comrade Chira, as representatives of the South African trade union movement, engage with counterparts from all unions, regardless of their affiliations. The objective of this initiative was to collectively agree that for one month, no union would handle Israeli goods in any form of transportation. This bold step was designed to test the movement's ability to convene and demonstrate uncompromising commitment. Yes, you heard that right. She urged the trade union to give up handling Israeli goods so they could prove what difference they could make. Drawing attention to the upcoming United Nations resolutions, Pandor called for vigilance to ensure that these resolutions aligned with the right principles. She highlighted the urgent need to assist the people of Palestine, particularly emphasizing their critical requirement for medical supplies, including bandages and medicines. Pandor issued a call to action to all 62 million South Africans, urging them to contribute either food or medical supplies for the people of Gaza. The plan was to coordinate the transportation of these donated goods to the Egyptian border with Palestine, providing much-needed support to those in distress in Gaza. Pandor underscored that taking action was of paramount importance, going beyond mere discussions. She called on organizers, strategists, and all individuals to set aside their differences to work collectively for change, emphasizing that unity was the key to progress. Nalady Pandor opened her speech by highlighting the distinct position of the developing South amidst escalating global tensions. Although she acknowledged that it might not be entirely accurate to treat the South as a singular, uniform entity, her experience had convinced her of its potential for the radical transformation required. Instead of looking to Northern countries, she advocated for a concerted focus on those in the South. It's because the world has been divided into North and South where the South always provided raw materials for the North. Even if Northern countries had no resources, they leveraged the resources coming from the South. Pandor observed a troubling global trend characterized by a growing resistance to the advocacy for collective action, international solidarity, and global cooperation. In its place, there was a resurgence of right-wing nationalism, unilateralism, and populism. She said that what's happening in Gaza demanded the collective attention and action of all. She encouraged greater media involvement, posing questions about the inconsistent responses to the murders of journalists based on their origins. Pandor drew attention to the murder of Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, expressing her dismay at the lack of media objectivity and emphasizing the need for an informed, balanced, and truthful media that presented the whole story. Even now, many journalists have lost their families in Gaza, due to Israel's bombing. However, the media seems to be insensitive about it. But if the Russian bombing had killed Ukrainian journalists, the Western world would have deemed Russia the most evil country. That's the double standard the world should know about. Pandor also pointed to the escalating global inequality and the unjust outcomes perpetuated by the global economy. She criticized developed countries that selectively disregarded international law while insisting that developing nations adhere to these rules, often at the expense of essential services for their citizens. To illustrate this, she cited the case of Ghana, which faced a financial crisis and subsequently reported economic growth after receiving loans from the IMF. This raised concerns about the impact on public services, education, healthcare, and housing. Furthermore, Pandor stressed the failure of developed countries to honor their commitments to the developing world and their tendency to shift responsibility for issues like climate change onto the global south. She underscored the importance of considering the sacrifices and concessions that southern governments had to make to access funding. She emphasized that it was unjust to expect them to limit their development, particularly when they had far less time to develop compared to their western counterparts. Pandor stressed that the crises of our time required international responses, 
She noted that the world was undergoing greater fragmentation, providing an opportunity for proponents of economic justice to collaboratively create a genuinely progressive alternative. She called upon progressive forces worldwide to advocate for multipolarity and a fairer, more inclusive multilateralism by actively influencing global debates. In other words, the world powers should create a feeling of accepting the rising powers instead of suppressing them. She said that silence was not an option. Expressing strong views was essential. Pandor emphasized the need for economies to serve the common good and to implement measures to protect the planet. In her perspective, addressing today's global challenges requires a different multilateral architecture. Despite its shortcomings, she believed the United Nations should retain its position as the primary institution for political, security, and development decision-making due to its representation, albeit imperfect. Perhaps, a weak system is better than no system at all. But she advocated for a comprehensive overhaul of the UN system, democratizing the UN Security Council to mirror the current global power distribution. She found it unacceptable that, nearly eight decades after its establishment, five nations still held disproportionate decision-making power in the Security Council, including countries that contributed to many global issues. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Pandora expressed concern about the situation where numerous UN resolutions passed by an overwhelming majority in the UN General Assembly were consistently disregarded as they were vetoed. She cited repeated calls from UN member states for Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories to the 1967 borders, which had been ignored. Instead, illegal settlements on Palestinian land had expanded, leading to increasing oppression and human rights violations against the Palestinian people. The Gaza Strip had been under siege for 16 years, with its residents struggling to access basic necessities. Despite the root cause of the conflict being illegal occupation, Western powers criticized Palestinians and showed support for the occupying force. That's hypocrisy, because earlier when Pandor did not label Russia as an occupying power in Ukraine, she was criticized by the West. Naledi Pandor stressed her opposition to double standards, identifying them as a byproduct of a global system that favored powerful nations. This system was disadvantageous for those striving for their rights and self-determination. She emphasized the need for social movements to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people, particularly given the biased media coverage of the ongoing violence. She gave another example. Within the United Nations, there had been nearly unanimous support from member states to end the 61-year-long illegal economic blockade of Cuba. Despite this, the Cuban population continued to face obstacles in accessing life-saving medications, essential goods, and the ability to engage in trade on par with other sovereign nations. These injustices required Global South and progressive forces worldwide to garner popular support for the Cuban people and oppressed individuals globally. Pandor discussed the efforts within the Department of International Relations and Cooperation in South Africa to provide aid to the people of Cuba after their appeal. However, opposition parties, aided by the organization AfriForum, brought the issue to court. The court's ruling mandated that the allocated funds be redirected to assist impoverished individuals in South Africa instead of providing aid to Cuba. Pandor was in the process of appealing this decision and expressed her concern that progressive forces in South Africa had not actively supported her legal battle. She highlighted how Afriforum's actions were undermining the progressive achievements in South Africa, including affirmative action, and the absence of vocal opposition to these actions. Pandor also underscored the necessity for an overhaul of the current global financial and trade architecture, a call echoed by many around the world. She believed it was crucial to undertake a fundamental reset of Bretton Woods institutions, including the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. All these institutions, which were established to ensure the West stays the master, should be rejected. Instead, multilateral development finance institutions are needed to effectively address the challenges they face and aid countries in achieving their sustainable development goals. These institutions have to be equipped to respond to public health emergencies and mitigate the impacts of climate change. 
Pandor advocated repurposing the IMF to provide counter-cyclical lending during periods of debt distress, facilitate debt restructuring and relief, and provide liquidity to countries in need. In addition, Pandor emphasized South Africa's participation in the BRICS partnership, which aimed to establish a more equitable, balanced, and representative global governance system. This restructuring effort extended to the global financial architecture. The creation of institutions like the New Development Bank, collectively owned by the BRICS countries, had granted emerging economies more control over lending and greater autonomy in addressing pressing global issues such as public health emergencies and climate change. Hence, Naledi Pandor highlighted the need to reposition the IMF. She advocated for a fundamental transformation Imagining the IMF as a source of counter-cyclical lending during periods of financial crisis, a facilitator of debt restructuring and relief, and a provider of essential liquidity to nations in need. Pandor also highlighted the unique opportunity of having emerging economies preside over the G20 presidency during the past four years. Indonesia had assumed the presidency the previous year, emphasizing the significance of development issues within the G20's agenda. This year, India continued to prioritize these issues during its presidency. Brazil was slated to take the G20 chair next year, and the importance of maintaining this progressive agenda was emphasized. South Africa was set to chair the G20 in 2025, providing another occasion for leading countries from the global south to exert a positive influence on the global agenda. It was a moment to champion genuine change and ensure that the enduring demands put forth over 50 years ago by the Global South when they convened as the Non-Aligned Movement were fulfilled. These demands included revising international trade regulations, overhauling the international financial system, and acknowledging the sovereignty of each nation over its natural resources. Pandor emphasized the necessity of establishing multilateral security arrangements and rejecting military alliances that fragment the world without offering solutions to global challenges. She drew attention to the concerning trend of weaponizing the ocean within the Indo-Pacific Alliance, intending to consolidate unilateral control over the world's oceans, thereby jeopardizing the potential for peace and development that the oceans offer. Pandor believed that South Africa should persist in contributing to the establishment of a global progressive movement that would be advantageous to Africa and the world. She stressed the significance of shaking people out of complacency and distractions and urged the progressive forces of the left to step in, offer hope and a vision, and provide concrete paths for political action across the global South. During her speech, she made it more than clear that South Africans will never be a part of organizations that work for the West because she exposed how the African Union was planning to invite Israel as its observer member, it became clear that even the African organizations were not free from Western influence. But how can someone speak so candidly, holding a government position? Well, this has to do with the kind of personality Naledi Pandor is. Grace Naledi Mandisa. Pandor, formerly known as Grace Naledi Mandisa, Matthews, was born on December 7, 1953, in Durban, Natal, South Africa. She is a well-known South African politician, educator, and academic who has been serving as the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation since 2019. You should know that she has been a member of parliament for the African National Congress since 1994. Yes, that's what makes her powerful because people know she is their voice. Pandor's educational path started in Botswana, where she completed her primary and secondary education. She graduated from Gaborone Secondary School and continued her academic journey. Between 1973 and 1977, she obtained a Certificate for Continuing Education from the University of Swaziland and a bachelor's degree from the University of Botswana. In 1978 and 1979, she pursued further education abroad, earning a Diploma in Education and an MA degree from the University of London. Later, in 1992, Pandor was awarded a Diploma in Higher Education Administration and Leadership from the Bryn Mawr Summer Program. In 1997, she undertook additional studies at Harvard Kennedy School, earning a Diploma in Leadership and Development. In that same year, she also completed an MA degree in Linguistics from the University of Stellenbosch. Pandor's dedication to education led her to pursue a PhD in Education at the University of Pretoria. In 2019, 
she successfully completed her doctoral studies with her thesis titled The Contested Meaning of Transformation in Higher Education in Post-Apartheid South Africa. Pandor's political journey began in 1994 when she became a member of parliament. Over the years, she held various significant positions within the African National Congress. In 1995, she became the Deputy Chief Whip of the ANC Caucus, and in 1998, she was elected Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, later becoming its chairperson in 1999. In 2004, she entered the National Cabinet as the Minister of Education under President Thabo Mbeki's administration. She retained this position under President Kagalema Motlanthi. Subsequently, in 2009, President Jacob Zuma appointed her as the Minister of Science and Technology. In 2012, she took on the role of Minister of Home Affairs. In 2014, she returned to the post of Minister of Science and Technology, which she held until 2018. Her commitment to education persisted, and she assumed the role of Minister of Higher Education and Training in President Cyril Ramaphosa's inaugural cabinet in 2018. However, after the 2019 general election, there was speculation about Pandora's potential appointment as Deputy President of South Africa. However, she was ultimately appointed as the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, a position she currently holds. While being the minister, she is paving a new way for South African foreign policy, making the country fully autonomous and powerful. What do you think? Is the African Union really working for African countries or it's another Western puppet? Should South Africa leave the African Union, creating another organization that is free, independent, and fully autonomous? Let us know your thoughts about Nalidi Pandor and her powerful words. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, the black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.